Good morning, New Life Church. Man, it's good to see everybody this morning. If I had not had the pleasure to meet you like Pastor Chris so eloquently spoke, my name is Mark, and this is my beautiful wife, Leslie, and, uh, and we are just so thankful. We're part of the uh, team that has planted uh, Russellville, Arkansas, man, and we are love what God is doing. But, but I, I want to start out giving honor where honor is due. You know, Pastor Rick and Michelle are Leslie and I's pastor. And we are so thankful for them, the way they believed in us and the way they have given us an opportunity to be part of the vision that God has given them for the state of Arkansas. And let me tell you, church, you see what God's doing here. He's doing it at 18 different campuses around the state. He is alive and well, and lives are being changed. Amen. Let's give it up for them right now. They are. And uh, we're just so thankful for them. I've known Pastor Rick for over 20 years, and I'll tell you something. I mean, his passion hasn't waned a bit. Actually, his passion has blown up, and I'm excited about the future of what God's going to do through this vision in this state, and we're excited about being part of it. Now, for some of you that don't know me, I, Leslie and I had been here for around three years, way back at the beginning of the, the building and, and all of that, and Pastor Rick's assignment that he gave us was to straighten out Harry Bates and Chris O. Well, what, what happened was we batted 500. <laughs> we, we didn't... <laughs> You know, I'm not going to tell you Chris was the only one we straightened out, but so since that, they ended up sending me up to the River Valley. So that's why um, we're up there. But Leslie and I, Leslie and I have been married for 35 years, this steaming young lady. God is so good. Hey, we have three grown kids, and check this out. We have five grandkids. God loves you when you get grandkids. I hear an amen from any of the grandpad and dads. It is, it is a bit of heaven on earth. Well, I'm going to jump right into this today, and what I'm talking about, what I want to talk to you about today is this battle uh, uh, of belief between belief and unbelief in our lives. You know, I, early on when I met Pastor Harry and we got to be friends, I, I was trying to convince him that I was prophetic, and I'm going to let you determine whether to believe that or <laughs> to be in unbelief over that. But I, I, and, I, and I shared a dream with him. And, and, and I had this dream. I told him I have dreams sometimes. I had this dream that, and unfortunately, Pastor Harry died in this dream. And he was standing in heaven. Wait, well, do you hear me out here before you don't believe me. He was standing in heaven with two other guys at the gate. And St. Peter looks at them three and says, listen, there's only one thing. Before I let you in, there's only one thing you, you, you can't do in heaven. You can't lie. If you lie, the ugliest woman in heaven will be attached to your side for eternity. So the first guy makes it about a week and a half, and he lies about how much money he's made. Bam, ugliest woman attached to his side for eternity. Second guy made it about three and a half weeks, and he lied about he was this professional athlete. Bam, ugliest woman in heaven attached to him for eternity. So here are these two guys are walking down the streets of gold with the ugliest woman attached to their side, and here comes Harry and one of the most beautiful women. Look looked like his wife, Jer Sherilyn, just beautiful. And they're looking, they're thinking, what in the world? And they go up to Harry, Harry, how'd you get her? He said, ask her. She said, I lied. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, Harry Bates, I love. <laughs> so obviously I fed your unbelief about my prophetic word this morning. So, <laughs> so let's jump right into this today. There is this battle. And for you and me to walk in a faith that honors God. Because the word of God is full of promises. It's full of Jesus doing incredible, incredible, incredible miracles. And listen, it's not just for us to read and say, boy, that's nice. Boy, that's sweet. No, it's there for us to put our faith on. On it because the promises of God are for today. He's still true to his promises. The miracles of God are for us today. In Hebrews eleven six, it says it like this. It says that, that faith is what pleases God. And I know one of the reasons it pleases God because it enables you and me, the people that he loves, to experience his best in our lives. And when it comes to this miracle promise thing, Every time that I talk about it, I can see the look in some of your eyes already. Because somewhere along your journey, we have bought into, and a lot of times we don't say it verbally, but we have bought into this, that, yeah, I believe that he's done miracles and he's been true to his promises. At I, I believe all of that, but in my life or for today, honestly, if you, if you were, to be honest, you, you're not really sure and so my goal today is to help 
you not to doubt them out of your life, but my goal today is to help you believe them into your life. I love this verse of scripture because it's present tense. Psalm 77, 14 says, you are the God of miracles and wonders. You still demonstrate your awesome power. He's referencing today. And throughout our 28 years of, mer- uh, of ministry, we have seen, like many of you, we've seen God do a lot of miraculous things. A few years back, we had a couple of the Joneses in our church where they had their baby premature, 28 weeks. It was a pound and a half. And it was battling for its life. And then at some point, it got spinal meningitis. And the doctor said, it's not going to make it. So the father, Mr. Storm, was in, in the parking garage at the hospital. It was UMA, UMAS? UMA, yeah, that place. They, they were, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm still stuck on the joke about Harry. But, but they, they um, he was in the, and he was reading. He went to James 5, where it says, call the elders of the church. I mean, he was so broken. He didn't know what else to do. So he called us to come pray and lay hands and he'll be healed. So we all came down. And to make a long story short, we prayed for that little boy. And God miraculously healed him that day. And here he is a couple of years later. Look at him. There he is right there. That is amazing. Come on, let's give God a hand. He's a God of miracles. <clears throat> You know, throughout the years, we've seen him heal, heal the, of infertility and of cancer, but we've also seen where other people had these things in their lives and the outcome was different, which leads us to the question, God, God why don't you do it the same way all the time? And sometimes, truthfully, the doubt, the unbelief begins to sneak in. And if we do not know how to deal with it, it literally can cripple us and rob us of the things that God has for us. Let me say this. How many of you right now, you need a miracle. You need God to do something big time in your life. Lift your hand up. Come on. How many in this place? Come on. My hands are up. You need him to do something big time. Now, let me ask you a question. When you need him to do something big time in your life, isn't it interesting? Do you ever struggle with this question? God, I know you can, but will you do this for me? How many, like, like you say, God, I've seen you do it in other people's lives. I've seen you d- do it. I, I know that you can, but will it turn out the same way for me? This morning, If you're walking around with this faith, belief, struggle in your life, I just want you to know you're not alone. And and, and there's hope and there's an answer to this. So, But the question is, what do we do with that question? What do we do with this struggle? Well, there is a great section of scripture, I believe, that was written to answer this question. And it's found in Mark chapter 9. We're going to go there in a minute. But what I like to do is I like to set this up for you a little bit so you really can grab the truth from this section of scripture that, 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 that God wants you to get. And, and what we see here, the disciples were in a heated debate with the religious leaders of that day. And what they were debating over was, what, does, does Jesus do miracles? And if he does, why don't they look the same? And why does he seem to do it for some and not for others? And Jesus is overhearing this conversation, and he jumps in the middle of the conversation, and like he always does, he brings truth that can change people's lives. So let's jump into it in verse number 16. It says, <clears throat> what are you arguing about? This is Jesus talking. And he asked a man, he asked that question. The man in the crowd said, and this is the subject of the argument. Here it is. He says, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth and he becomes rigid. <laughs> Some of you are thinking that my kid did that last night. I need a miracle. But anyway, he, so, so, so th- then this verse continues. Look at this. And, and this is really important. He, a- he said, I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Stop there. Everybody look at me for a minute. Now, this is a big deal because up to this point, The disciples were acing this. They were seeing people healed and delivered. They were seeing miracles up to this point. And the father, that's why he brought his boy to them, because he heard of their reputation. Their reputation preceded them. And they believed, because that's all they ever saw. They believed, but they couldn't understand why it didn't happen. So for the first time, we see in the word of God, we see this debate starting. Was it us? Did something change? Did, you know, did, 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 what's going on here? Is it God? 
And I think it's the same thing we can ask when things don't seem to be working out the way we thought they were. And I like to say this, they can kind of become what I call unbelieving believers. They believed, but they just weren't sure how it was going to turn out. They, they were confused. They, they were frustrated. And I know many can relate to this, but Jesus got a little frustrated with them. Let's go on in this scripture, section of scripture. He said, you unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. They brought him when they saw this, when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into convulsions. He fell to the ground. He rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? And the father said, from childhood. This father, since this boy was a baby, he, he has, he's been believing actually just for a long time. It says it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But listen, hear, hear this statement. But the father said, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Listen, that is a very vulnerable statement. And I think what he was trying to say, he wasn't saying no. He, you know, he wasn't saying, can you do this? Because he knew Jesus' reputation. I mean, throughout the whole region of the, of the world at that time. I mean, it, his power followed him everywhere. People were raised from the dead, healing. I mean, delivered from demons. I mean, it was happening all over. I mean, his shadow was healing people. He knew. Listen, I'm clear on this. He knew that Jesus could. But this is what I was thinking he was asking more so. But are you going to do this for me? And then here, Jesus responds, if you can. He said, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed. In the Greek, that word literally means to croak. It's that nasty sound that ravens make. And actually, I've been practicing that for you, but I'm going to spare you. But anyway, so, so, so he was so frustrated. So this was his response. Now listen, because I think we all can relate. I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. How many of us have been there? I mean, I do believe, but I got this doubt and unbelief mixture going on. I don't know how to get rid of this unbelief because everything I see in front of me in the natural doesn't look like this is working out at all. And if we're going to experience God's promises and miracles in our lives, church, we got to deal with the unbelief and the doubt. We got to kick it out of our lives. So I want to talk today, I think there's a number of things that we can learn from this section of scripture, and I want to start out by just talking very quickly about three causes of doubt, and I know this will help you. Number one, if you're taking notes today, is this. We believe like those we surround our lives with. Now, please hear me on this, everybody. The faith level of the people in your everyday life impacts you i mean for good and or for bad in a big way it's infectious the bible says in romans it says faith comes by hearing and hearing i like to say it like this i'll throw it up on the screen what you're listening to the most is where your faith is the greatest think about this now think about someone who solely watches cnn bring them into a room and think about somebody who solely watches fox news <laughs> and bring them into a room. Enough said. Listen, if you are around faith-filled people, you're apt to believe God is faithful. But if you're around naysayers and doubters and people that don't believe, if you're around negative people, I love this, this statement someone made. They said this. They said negative people have a problem for every solution. Think about that for a minute. It's so true. But, but, but nobody likes that. And when you put yourself in that environment... What ends up happening, it messes you up, and it causes unbelief and doubt to creep into your life. And we see this happening right here in this section of Scripture. In verse 19, Jesus says, you unbelieving generation. You notice he didn't say, you unbelieving dad, because he had surrounded himself with all of these doubters. And it's obvious to me. 
that we live in an unbelieving generation. People in our, in, in our culture are more apt to say Jesus can't do it than to say what the Bible says, that Jesus can do anything. That's a good place to say amen or give me something out there, because he can. He is a God of promises. And that's why it's so important that you choose your close friends wisely. Listen, this is, young people, hear me. This is why it's so important you choose the people that you're going to talk about your situations with, your challenges with, wisely. You know, the Bible says there, there's wisdom in the multitude of counselors. But I think sometimes we ask advice from way too many people. It's, and, and, and we need, and that's why we do life giving, life, you know, life groups around here because you, it gives you an opportunity to be connected to life giving relationships that help you kick out the doubt and unbelief in your life. Let's jump to number two. We tried things that did not work. Now, if you look in verses 17 and 18, the man's answered in the crowd. He starts talking about his son. I brought my son. And he told about his son being demon-possessed. But this is at the end of that verse, it says, I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. He knew this happened hundreds of times. So he tried it, and it did not work. Maybe you've gotten that book. You know, that everybody told you to get the five steps to whatever. And you watch someone and take those five steps, and man, the miracle worked out for their lives. You tried those five steps, and nothing played out for you. You tried things. Now, come on, we all have that did not work. Growing up, my plan was to be a professional baseball player. That's what I wanted to do with my life. When I graduated from high school, I, I signed with the San Francisco Giants, and, and when they ended up cutting me, and I want to say something about that. First of all, they're, they're, not, a real, they're not a real good judge of talent, and second of all, I, <laughs> and second of all, I'm going to tell you right now, they missed out on two or three World Series over the time that I would have been with them, but I'm going to move on past that. But when I didn't know, when I got back, man, I was just lost. I mean, I was as lost as last year's Easter egg. You'll get that here in a moment. I was as lost as an Arkansas Razorback fan at the national championship game. Oh, I'm sorry. I had that. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I told Harry I didn't want to say that, but he, you know, I, he's my boss. I have to. But anyway, um, but I was real lost. And I didn't know where I was going, what I was doing. Then you have all those people around you that are real spiritual, like, oh, yeah, God told me, he spoke to me. I know exactly what he's called me to do and all of that. And here I'm just trying to figure out, God, what do you want me to do with my life? I'm thinking about Moses and how Moses, you know, he had the burning bush. And God, give me a burning bush moment. I need to hear. And when I was going through this process and, and looking for this burning bush moment, I realized when you look in the scriptures, God only burned the bush one time. And another, what, I, what I'm trying to say is, don't try to make your story like someone else's. Because God has something for you. He is working out a beautiful story. I mean, an awesome story for you. And it may not look like someone else's because it's not supposed to. He knows exactly what you need. And he knows the best thing for you. And number three, the, the last thing I, I want to talk about that sorts out doubt, and we'll get into the, the remedy here, is, is um, causes doubt is we sort of believe. I heard a guy say this. It's so good. We sort of believe. And that's a funny way to say it, and, but I, I think that, that you can rate. It's that, it, it's that believing and unbelieving thing. It's that faith and doubt kind of button heads in your heart kind of thing. It's like you were believing God for a long time for something. Like, for instance, if you have a wayward child, and I mean, we had a wayward child for years, and you're praying. When you first pray, I mean, your faith is bowed up. It's like, yeah, God, you're going to do this, and I'm confident in this, and we're speaking it and growing. But as time goes on and nothing changes in the natural, it's not happening in the time frame that we wanted to or think it should, and doubt and unbelief begin to creep in. Ultimately, what happens, this is what happens over time. We get lulled into this sort of belief like this, lukewarm, I'm not hot or cold about this anymore, I'm like, honestly, I'm like, whatever, because we buy into lies like God's not fair. God, you know, I, I, I haven't been good enough. I don't deserve this. I was a, a bad parent or whatever. 
And before you know, we, we, we land in that place that, and it's a dangerous place to get. I just sort of believe. And see, the father was there. This father in verse 24 said immediately the boy exclaimed, I do, the father's, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. I, I sort of believe. And look at me, everybody. God can't do anything with that. With I, I sort of believe, and thank God there's a remedy, but this is where it leads, and test yourself now. I want you to look within yourself now. Ultimately, when we get lulled into that sort of belief, we, come to, we get to the place, and I see it all the time, where we become skeptics of God's miracles. We become skeptical whether God is a God of miracles. When, God, when, when he has called us to church to show the world that our God is still in the miracle-working business. And that's another amen. You missed another opportunity. i got to get you guys on track here. Listen, sometimes, and, and we all do this, we, we're not in the biblical mindset. We get in the Western mindset. And when you're in the Western mindset, what happens if things don't happen in the time we think they should, we end up kicking out belief. And we take on unbelief. And this is the result. In James 1, it says it like this, verse 6, it says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Instability. There's no girth to your faith. It says that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. This sort of just brings frustration. And I share these three with you because I have walked through all three of these phases in my life. And they have robbed me in a way in my life. But thank God he's given us a way to kick out the doubt. And the unbelief. You know why? Because he is a God who is true to his promises today. So how do we go from help my unbelief, help me overcome my unbelief to faith? What do we do? Well, I want to share just a personal story with you that really helped me in this arena of my life. About 11, 12 years ago, uh, we were pastoring in Columbus, Ohio, and God had called us to come right here to Arkansas, the New Life Church at Arkansas. Up to that point, I didn't even know Arkansas was a state. I didn't even know where it was. But anyway, so, so, so he had called, and it was really clear that he called us, but we had moved there a few years prior, and we built a house at the peak of the housing market. And a year later, the housing market crashed. We had 70 or 80 lots around us, and so we're called to come down here. We're clear about that. So we needed a miracle to sell the house for her, at least, you know, come out of it okay. And listen, it, nothing was shaken. We couldn't. I mean, it just wasn't. We were believing God for this miracle. Then you know what happens when you're believing him for something? You hear about all these amazing things God's doing for everybody else. Like one guy saying, I got 10 times the cost of my whoop de do. I mean, you know, but, but you know, I, I'm, I'm thankful for him. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 let's just move on. But... Um, we needed this miracle, but we couldn't sell it. And we're hearing the stories, and I tell you what, doubt and unbelief just started creeping in. And honestly, I was asking why, because God's the one who called us to come here. And I believe right now there are many people, you're, you're praying for your miracle, you're holding on, you're looking for something in this room right now, but nothing is happening. And like you, you're saying, God, when is this going to happen for me? Let me say this before I get to the remedy. Through this journey of frustration, battling with doubt and belief, Leslie and I have learned, and we are continuing to learn, how to truly have a faith that, that, that honors God. I hated the process. I still do. You know, but we're still growing. But I can tell you right now, it has moved our faith ball down the field for sure. So let's quickly go through three things that will help you kick out the doubt and, and, and that will help you overcome your unbelief. Number one, a faith that honors God believes when it doesn't see. Now, you've got you to gotta wrap your mind around this one because this truth, because in the natural, you will not see. We had no clue how this house thing was going to work out. We had to believe something that we didn't see. And actually, Hebrews 11.1, 1, it defines 
faith like this. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of we, what we do not see. We had to go from this place of doubt to surety, to be sure and, and certain about something. So I wish I had this great revelation I'm getting ready to share with you, but really, we just had to make up our minds, whether it took a year or whether it took 10 years, that God was going to do something. Whether we saw it or not, we just knew that God was working. He was working out a miracle. We didn't know what that miracle looked like, but we knew that he was. And I'm going to tell you what we banked it on is we banked it on the fact that our God is faithful and that is his very nature. Now, let me ask you a question. You can't lie in church because you know what Pastor Rick says, you lie in church. Oh, it won't be pretty. How many of you have ever done some stupid things in your life, raise your hand. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Unanimous. <laughs> I do it pretty regularly. But one of them, I was uh, taking young people. I used to take young people around the world on mission trips. And one year, we were in the Bataan jungle. And we're going through the Bataan jungle, and we come up to this Mayan tomb. And on the, at this Mayan tomb, my kids started like Daring me, Pastor Mark. They wanted me to go up and grab a vine and swing like Tarzan, like Pastor Tarzan, Pastor Tarzan kind of thing. And so let, let me back up and let me back up and say this to you. Just tell you a little bit about me. At that point, I was a city boy. Okay, listen. I was afraid of heights. I hated snakes. I hated spiders. I couldn't swim. None, this is all true. And I, didn't, I wouldn't even eat venison to this day. Just to give you an idea of how, what a city boy I was. But I was too proud to admit to them that I was afraid. I was afraid every step in that stinking jungle. So they're saying, Pastor Tarzan. They wanted me to get up and grab the vine. Pastor Tarzan. And you know, guys, when you're called out like that, what are you going to do? So I looked at my leader and I said, hey, tell my wife I love her and tell my kids I'll see him on the other side. And I started climbing up on that mine tube. And I'm just thinking I'm going to go like this. And one of the anacons is going to grab me and suck me in, you know. Or, or one of the big spiders. The spiders were so big down there, they needed leashes for them. Like they called them by names. And a spider was going to get me. Or I was going to get up to grab a vine. And, and one of them snakes going to wrap me, suck me. Up. You know, all of those things are going through your mind. So I get up on that tube and I grab a vine real quick. And you know, when you're scared, you're just going to jump, right? <laughs> you don't want to think about it. So I just jumped. And here I am going, Pastor Tarzan. Dun, dun, dun. You know, I'm coming down and all of a sudden as I'm coming down right there in front of me was this little girl turned sideways not paying attention and now look at all this body just imagine this warp speed it was coming down on this deal so I'm coming and you know how you like you want to tell someone to look out I wanted to say it, but it wouldn't come out I went, ah, pow she is considered a UFO they're still she's still an unidentifying flying object to this day Oh, listen, I killed that girl, but I am so glad that I did. Not glad that I killed her, all right? What I'm so glad about, look at everybody right now. I didn't kill her. I promise I didn't kill her. <laughs> listen, she's never gotten married because she's disfigured, but I never killed her. I promise I didn't. So, um, <laughs> but... Uh, here's my point, all right? I'm so glad that I did it, not kill, you know, hit her. I am so glad that I jumped because faith, it's a thrill of a lifetime. You guys can't get past me doing it. <laughs> faith is a thrill of a lifetime. You're, you're, you're on the edge of an amazing opportunity, but sometimes, church, you just got to jump. You got to just trust and jump. Faith is not for the faint-hearted. You got to believe in what you don't see. Number two, it doesn't quit when nothing changes. Okay, going back to our story. So after about three years, we still hadn't sold the house. The market was going down. I mean, you know, we were going through like, God, what's going on? We're, we're, we're still hearing all the stories of how God's amazingly doing things for everybody else. And we're going whoop de doo And all of that is going on. But we had to come to the place still. Well, what we decided to do, we were just going to have faith in God. And listen, I, I know this sounds, you know, n n not revolutionary, but we had to just keep praying. And if you read in Mark 9 at the end of this section of Scripture, prayer was a big deal, Jesus said. It played a huge part in that little boy being delivered. Colossians 4, 2 says, be persistent in prayer and keep alert as you pray, giving thanks to God. In other words, keep praying and never give up. There, that's the faith that honors God. And everybody look at me for a minute. I'm going to tell you a really quick story. My daughter, 
she was running from God for about seven, eight years, an alcoholic. She lost her marriage, her family, her kids. That's one of the reasons why we had to, we had to go back. And we prayed for her for all those seven, eight years. Many times we had no idea where she was. You know how that all goes, everybody, if you have, if you have kids that are wayward. But this past year, one thing Nicole would never, ever fake was giving her heart to Christ. God got a hold of her, her life and changed her life. She has been in rehab for over six months. It is amazing what God has done. But okay, now the reason why I told you that is all of those years I've been praying, at times I didn't think they were having an impact. And this is what the Lord showed me. He'll, he shows us things differently, but I can back this up with Scripture. He, sh he said to me, every time you prayed, Mark, I answered your prayer. And he showed me as, as a little dot that would hit the darkness in her life. He said, every time you prayed, that dot just continued. The dots just continued to hit the darkness until one day it broke a hole in the darkness and she saw the light. Listen, be persistent in your prayer. And, and that, that, this, this dad in Mark 9, he'd been praying for his son's healing all this time, just like many of you are. Come on, man. Listen to me. Have a faith that does not quit not, when nothing changes. And here's the last one. It works. A faith that honored God works when it doesn't all add up. People may not understand why you're holding on to this miracle. They're looking at you like you're a little cray-cray. Listen, let them think you're all the cray-cray they want to think, but you hold on because God got a miracle for you. It may not look the way you think it looked, but I'm going to tell you what, it'll turn out better than you ever believed it could turn out. I love this word here, and it's works. I said, it, and I, I put it right up front, works when it doesn't all add up. Because we know that faith is more than just prayers. It's action as well. In John 2, it says, you see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete. Now, everybody say this with me. By what he did. Say it again. By what he did. Listen. God is faithful. He's true to his promises. And to have a faith that honors God, we believe when we don't see. We don't quit when nothing changes. And we work at it when it doesn't all add up. And then God showed us our miracle going back to my story. And listen, this is what I learned through this process is I learned that God wasn't holding anything back from me. I learned that he was teaching me something. And that he was preparing a miracle for me that I never asked for. Now listen to this. Three years later after we moved here, we had to go back because of my daughter and my grandsons. They got a divorce. They had nowhere to go. They couldn't make it in the city. They couldn't leave the state. So we had to go back to help them. We had a friend that was running our house. And two months prior to us going back, they called us and said they bought a house. And they could get a house a lot cheaper than ours. And they were moving out. Just at the time that we needed to move back, and we moved back into that same house that we wanted him to sell <laughs> five years ago when we were able to take our two grandsons from some of the most insecure, unstable times of their lives. And then, it was a total of about five years later after all of this, we were able to sell our house way more than we could have ever sold it five years earlier. God answered my miracle prayer five years before, but he had something so much better. Can we give him a hand this morning? Come on, he did. Listen, God, they're gonna put this up on the screen. God has a miracle for you, but many times the miracles are far greater than the one you were originally asking for. Hold on to that. He is that good. He's a good, good father. And this is the heart of everything that we've learned. They're going to throw it up on the screen for me. Faith believes God can, but trust him even if he doesn't. Man. Let's bow our head and shut our eyes.